world of 6x7 cameras, there are really three main players in the field. The Mamiya 7, the Mamiya RB67 and RZ67, and of course the Pentax 67 SLR. Now there's a couple of other cameras that are not quite as well known but are equally capable. The first is the Fuji 670 series of cameras, and of course the Bronica GS1. Once you get past these five main players though, there really are very few other options. There are a couple of kind of obscure options, the Plowbell Makina 67 and the Voigtlander Bessa 667 are two well-known examples. There is one other really strange camera, the Linhoff 220, which shoots 6x7 in a really strange form factor camera. Uh, this was made back in the 1960s. Now, I don't own any of these cameras, uh, mainly because they're, most of them are well outside of my price range. <laughs> these cameras all sell for multiple thousands of dollars, some of them up to five or six thousand dollars. So when I decided I wanted to try my hand at 6x7 photography, I went a slightly cheaper route <laughs> and ended up um, looking at and purchasing a Kony Omega Rapid. The Kony Omega Rapid offers a lot of the same features that you find in the much more expensive cameras, such as interchangeable lenses and rangefinder focusing, all in a professional level form factor at a much, much lower price point. At the time of this video, you can buy a Kony Omega for as little as around $100 and a really nice quality one for maybe four to $500. Now I'm gonna dive into the history of the camera and a word of warning, this is a little bit long. So if you're not interested in the history, skip forward to about the seven minute mark. The Kony Omega Rapid was first introduced in 1964. It was jointly developed by Simon Omega, the company famous for its darkroom enlargers, and Konishi Roku, the Japanese company that was manufacturing Konica cameras at the time. Now the story of how this camera came to be is very convoluted, uh, so I'll just give a brief overview here. And by brief, I mean <laughs> I'll keep it to under five minutes, I hope. In the mid-1930s, the Simmon brothers of Long Island, New York, established a business manufacturing high-quality darkroom enlargers. And then within just a few years, they began marketing their enlargers under the Omega name brand, a brand that would end up being used up until around 2014. During World War II, the Simmon brothers were approached by the U.S. Navy to develop a lightweight, rugged camera that would provide relatively large negatives. And the result of that collaboration was a camera called Combat Camera PH-501-PF. <laughs> From what I've read, it's estimated that around 250 of these cameras were built. Now, after the war, the Simmon brothers decided to build on the basic concept of that camera, and in 1954, they introduced their first and what would end up being their only civilian camera, which they called the Omega 120. And this camera was intended primarily for professional press and studio use. Now, uh, as you can see, the Omega 120 was a pretty ungainly looking camera, but it did establish the basic functional features that made it very reliable and fast to operate in the field. Fred Simmon, the designer of the camera, also created the two and a quarter by two and three quarter inch format for 120 roll film, which is what we now call six by seven. And he created this specifically to create the most efficiently sized large negatives on 120 film that would be closest in aspect ratio to uh, what are standard US and UK print sizes of four by five, eight by 10, 16 by 20 inches, etc. Now, unfortunately, the Omega 120 was not a commercial success and they ended up discontinuing it just a few years later in 1958. And then a few years after that, in 1961, the Simmon brothers themselves ended up retiring and they sold their company and holdings to another company called Berkey Photo um, from New York City. Berkey was a major photo developer and photo equipment distributor at that time. And here's where things start getting a little interesting. Even though the original Omega 120 was a commercial disappointment, by the early 60s, the increasing popularity of color print films like Kodacolor had resurrected the demand for a professional medium format press camera 
since color films of that time were not yet good enough to produce uh, very good results from 35 millimeter film. So Berkey Photo realized they had owned the rights to the Omega 120 camera, but also realized it wouldn't sell in the form that it had been manufactured in the 50s. Now, they also knew that the increasing labor and manufacturing costs that were taking place in the U.S. at that time would make it essentially impossible to manufacture the camera in the U.S. and at a competitive price. Now, in addition to its photo finishing business and Omega and larger division, Berkey also just happened to be the sole U.S. distributor for Konishi Roku, uh, which of course were the makers of Konica cameras. And to make a long story short, Simon Brothers' research and development team ended up collaborating with Konishi Roku Photo Industry to develop the Kony Omega Rapid Camera, which was then manufactured by Konishi Roku. Hence uh, the camera's name, which you probably already figured out, <laughs> Kony Omega. Now, in 1968, the Kony Omega Rapid M model was released, and this was later called simply the Kony Omega M. The M stands for magazine, and the big difference between the Kony Omega Rapid and the new Kony Omega Rapid M being that the latter has a fully contained film magazine which allows the photographer to interchange film backs even uh, partially through a roll of film. Now, once we hit the early 1970s, this is where the trail starts to get a little bit fuzzy in the development of the camera. There are a number of websites, in fact, almost every uh, website online that I was able to find indicates that the Kony Omega Rapid series um, converted into the Rapid Omega series in 1975. From my research, the uh, transition actually happened in late 1973. And what's, uh, what's known is that the camera manufacturer was transitioned from uh, Konishi Roku or Konica to Mamiya. And um, I'm not able to figure out exactly why that happened. So that's the part of the research that's still ongoing. Now, what I do know is that in 1972, Konishi Roku had reorganized itself into a new company, Yamanashi Konica. I don't know if that played into the decision to transition from Konica to Mamiya for manufacture of the camera, but it is interesting that that happened around the same time. So in 1973, the Kony Omega Rapid became the Rapid Omega 100, and the Kony Omega Rapid M became the Rapid Omega 200. So the camera that I ended up buying was the original Kony Omega Rapid. Um, and as you can see, it's a very large camera. Now let's talk about a few features of the camera. Um, it is obviously a rangefinder camera. So the rangefinder is up here. It's actually got a very bright, um, easy to use, as you can see, very large window rangefinder. And the rangefinder uh, is a little unique in that it has compensation both for parallax error and also for field of view error. So as you focus more closely to closer subjects, the parallax correction comes into play and then the field of view, which changes slightly, is also compensated for. So pretty advanced rangefinder. Now the controls on the camera are a little unusual. Um, you slip your hand in here and by design, uh, you put your pinky underneath the bottom of the grip on the left side of the camera and then you focus with this dial on the right side of the camera. So it's a little strange. <laughs> now probably the most distinctive feature on the camera is the way that the film is wound. It's wound with this lever here which is a push-pull lever. So you pull it out and push it back in and you have wound the camera. <laughs> Uh, pretty distinctive. Uh, a couple other interesting features on the camera. It actually has three cold shoes on top of the camera for various accessories. Um, you can mount the wide angle viewer for the wide angle lens there. I also mount a small little light meter when I'm using the camera. Uh, this camera is 100% mechanical. There is nothing electronic on this camera at all. No light meter, but also no batteries. So it does have that advantage. The standard lens on the camera is this 90mm f3.5. 
the controls for the shutter speed and the aperture are on the lens and they operate in the reverse direction from one another. So once you've set your initial setting, so in this case I've got f16 at 1 30th of a second, uh, by design you can grab both of those rings together and then rotate to different settings and it will retain the same EV exposure value for all of those settings. So quite clever there. Now all of the lenses for this camera have built-in slide-out lens hoods, which is quite handy. You don't have to carry around extra lens hoods. Now the operation of the push-pull lever system both advances the film and also cocks the shutter. So as long as you're using this lever to wind the film, you will not accidentally do a double exposure on the film. However, you can do a manual double exposure because the linkage for the shutter cocking mechanism is um, external to the lens. It's right here at the bottom of the lens. So if you've advanced the film to a new frame, taken one exposure, you can manually cock the shutter down here by simply pushing this lever over. The film has not advanced and now you can take another exposure on that same frame. Now one thing about these cameras that can be a little confusing is the advanced lever is designed to slowly move outward and have a shorter stroke as you advance through the 10 frames of 6x7 on a roll. So it might appear that there's something wrong because as you advance farther into the roll this lever goes a less and less distance as you can see. Um, and that might appear that something's wrong, but that's actually by design. There is a cam system in, in the winding mechanism that prevents the lever from going too far as the film is advanced in order to maintain the same film spacing um, for every frame. Now, once you get to the last frame, so if I continue to cock this all the way to frame 10, now it goes all the way back in. And when I, after I shoot that last frame, frame 10, this then locks, the advanced lever locks. And that, again, is by design. It's intended such that as a professional, as you're shooting all of your pictures, you don't have to keep track of where you are. The advance will lock once you finish the roll to let you know that roll is finished. And then um, to roll up the film, you simply release that lock with the center button in the back. And then you can unload the film and load another uh, film. Now, why is this camera called Rapid? Well, the most obvious reason is the push-pull winding mechanism, which allows you to run through 6x7 frames very quickly compared to other 6x7 cameras. So this is a fantastic feature when you're trying to shoot off a lot of frames very quickly, like in a wedding or some other fast-paced assignment. But this is not the only reason why this is called a Rapid. It has several other tricks up its sleeve. First of all, the back of the camera comes off completely. So once you hit load on the back of the camera, switch this over to unlock and the back of the camera comes off. Now for a lot of cameras, the back of the camera comes off completely. That part is not unusual. What makes this one a little unusual is that you load the film into the back, not into the camera once the back of the camera is off. So that helps speed up the process because loading the film is very simple. You simply take the roll, the empty reel off of one side, put it on the other side, spool in your new film, and you are ready to go. Now, the other big advantage of loading the film into the back is that means you can also have multiple backs ready to go, preloaded with film. And if you're on a, a high-speed assignment where you need to have a lot of film ready to go right away, you can have multiple backs at the ready, quickly switch them out, um, or have your photo assistant reloading film um, in backs as you're moving along. So again, lending itself toward that rapid name and rapid assignment. Now, um, one last interesting feature to talk about with these backs, in order to accommodate the fast winding mechanism without damaging the film, the pressure plate is actually uh, an intermittent pressure plate. So it releases pressure when you're winding, and then as you're taking your picture, the pressure plate is engaged and the film is held flat. So between shots, when you're winding the camera, the pressure plate releases, allows the film to travel very quickly without scratching the film or damaging the film, and then as you take your next picture, that pressure plate engages. Quite clever. 
Now I'll admit, when I first held this camera, uh, it felt pretty awkward. It's a very large camera. Um, the grip takes a little getting used to because it does require you to put your pinky under the grip. At first it doesn't feel very natural. It's a left-handed shutter, which feels a little strange. The focus being a dial focus feels strange. And then the winder mechanism being a push-pull wind also feels strange. However, I will say after putting a few rolls through this camera, I have grown to really love uh, this system. The way the instruction manual instructs you to hold the camera, you basically hold the lower end of the camera by this winder mechanism. You can see it's got a large smooth dial here. You hold that with the heel of this hand, and then this hand is supporting the other side, and then your hand just naturally goes to this focus dial. And as you're focusing, this is actually feels very natural and very fast. So I can see why they set it up this way, but I will say it takes some getting used to. It took me a while to get used to the left hand shutter. Again, once I got used to it though, I actually really like it and I really like the way this camera handles. Okay, so let's look a little bit more closely at how the film is loaded. So first the back has to be set to load and then you unlock the switch on, back of, on the back of the back to open the back, take the back off. In this case, I have film that I just finished, so that comes out, of course. Now we open the new film, move the empty spool to the uptake side, drop the new film in, and feed it. And then once you've wound that on so that the arrow lines up with the little red dot, then the back is ready to go. It's just that simple. Now to keep it going, you drop the back onto the camera, lock it in place, and then uh, using the winder, wind up to the first frame. Very simple. Well, I'm out here near Easton, uh, just east of the Cascade Range, just east of Snoqualmie Pass in Washington State. Um, not sure what the name of this lake is. I'll have to look it up once I get back to the house. So I'm out here with the Coney Omega and looking for a few snow shots. Um, we're right in late February right now. So snow is starting to recede, but as you can see here, there's still plenty of snow um, to get a photo of and the lake is still a little bit iced over. Um, I'm not too far off the highway here, so hopefully that noise is not distracting too much. So I'm just gonna kind of scope out a few shots here and uh, maybe fire off a few shots and see what I get. Now, one of the challenges in shooting in snow, of course, is the extreme contrast between the bright highlights in the snow and as you can see, it's a very overcast day. It's actually sprinkling a little bit. So the shadows are quite deep. Uh, so that's quite a range of contrast to try to capture on film. Um, we'll see how that looks. I think I'm probably going to let the stumps and other shadows kind of go to black and then try to get more tonality out in the ice. We'll see how that goes. Um, it is a little bit drizzly kind of a snow slushy rain mix here so I don't want to keep the camera out in these conditions for too long so I think I'll just fire off a few shots and see how that goes. I also recently took the camera with me on a trip to the southwest Washington coast and the cabin that we were staying in had this poster uh, on the wall which had obviously been there for a very long time um, and I in reading the poster and looking at the bottom information about this steamer TJ Potter I discovered that it was actually still in Astoria and so I wanted to drive down and take some photos.
Okay, what are my final thoughts on this camera? Well, like I said before, I've grown to really love how the camera handles. I actually really like the layout of the controls, as odd as they may feel at first. <laughs> In terms of image quality, the lenses are certainly very sharp. Some of the contemporary reports that I was reading from magazines of the period compared these lenses very favorably to Hasselblad lenses of the time, and in looking at the results that I got, I have no reason to doubt that. Now, if you're looking to buy one of these cameras yourself, in the US at least, there are tons of these out there. I will say uh, this camera was very popular as a wedding photographer's camera back in the 70s and early 80s. So a lot of the cameras that are for sale today have been very heavily used. That is not uncommon. So as you're looking through cameras available for sale, make sure you pick one that looks like it has been used the least. Once you find a camera that you're satisfied with, make sure you download a copy of the manual and read that through to get familiar with the controls before you use it. Good luck. Uh, thanks again for watching and I will see you in the next video.